Your first item is to conduct your first citizens participation period. So this is the first time set aside for public comment. Anyone wishing to provide public comment with regards to an item that is on today's agenda, please step forward to the microphone, state your name, spell your last name for the record, and please limit your comments to three minutes. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and close the first public comment period. Thank you. Uh, the next item on your agenda is to approve the agenda. Oh. Does uh, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Thompson, Terry Thompson, want to speak on this time? Okay, we'll go ahead and reopen the first public comment period. And Mr. Thompson, did you want to speak? Good morning, commissioners. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Terry Thompson. I'm the VP of operations and general manager for MV. I uh, just wanted to come before the commissioners today to say thank you for the amazing 10 year uh, partnership. We really appreciate it. Um, and also just wanted to say that you have our full commitment to uh, ensure that uh, First Transit has a seamless transition. We're gonna work closely with them and we're gonna continue to press and make it the best system that we can while we're here. So thank you very much for your time and the opportunity. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. We appreciate that. We'll go ahead and close the first public, public comment period. And uh, Thank you, Vice Chair. The next item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. It's in order and ready for your approval. All right, can I get a motion to approve the agenda? Second. All right, there's a motion to approve the agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next item is to elect a chair and a vice chair. All right, I understand there may be a motion in order from our mayor. Yes, the I most experienced member of the board. <laughs> I would like to move that our vice chair become chair. All right, thank you very much, Mayor. I am going to nominate my colleague, uh, Councilman Barone, as vice chair. Um, again, it's a big honor, and I will say, Mayor, I will repeat, like I said before, you are timeless. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, there's a motion uh, on the floor. Um, to elect me as chair and uh, Councilman Barone as the vice chair. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you guys very much. Motion carries. Well, then, uh, then I'd like to, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the next item on the agenda is to receive the CEO report. So first, I'd like to officially welcome Henderson Councilman Dan Shaw to the RTC board. In addition to his government service, the councilman currently serves on the Nevada State College Foundation Board of Directors and previously served as chair of the Clark County Planning Commission and the City of Henderson Planning Commission. Additionally, the councilman was the owner of RMI Development, RMI Investment Services and Realty Management, as well as president of the Vista Group where he oversaw the development and construction of shopping centers, office parks, apartment projects, and industrial office facilities throughout Southern Nevada. Councilman, we are really excited to have you on our board. Look forward to working with you. Our next item uh, is a presentation from RTC's FAST Director, uh, Teresa Geiser, on the state of the traffic system. Teresa? Good morning and thank you. Good morning, members of the board and uh, to, Vice, uh, to Chairman Jones and Vice Chairman Barone. Started. My name is Teresa Gazer. I am the director of the FAST division of the Regional Transportation Commission for the record. Today I will be presenting the current state of our regional traffic system. FAST utilizes traffic system management and operation, also known as TISMO, strategies to make the most of our existing traffic infrastructure. We are focused on the key goals of improving safety, reducing congestion, and preserving the capacity of our existing roadway system. We have a real challenge with the increased number of vehicle to pedestrian incidents. The pedestrian fatality rate in Southern Nevada went from 57 to 78 fatalities in 2021 to 2022. As for capacity and congestion, we can simply not pave more roads to keep up with the activity at the pace of our growing Southern Nevada region. We need to take another look at how we move millions of people through our city each day and find innovative ways to keep our community moving. 
on a whole in southern Nevada, fast traffic management system is comprised of over 1,600 traffic signals throughout all of the jurisdictions, over 1,000 traffic cameras, 74 ramp meters at freeway on-ramps, 1,500 miles of fiber optic communication connecting all of this ITS infrastructure together, and 168 dynamic message signs or active traffic management gantries. Those are the arrow over lane signs along the freeway. FAST operates the traffic management system in the Southern Nevada area on behalf of the Nevada Department of Transportation, as well as the local agencies who are the owners of this infrastructure. Let's talk about traffic signals in Southern Nevada. In fiscal year 2022, FAST identified 300 signalized intersections with reoccurring vehicle detection issues. FAST is working with our local agency partners to replace damaged signal detection. We know that signal detection increases the delays that you experience as you're driving along your Southern Nevada local roadways. In 2022, there were over 1 million signal vehicle preemptions and Southern Nevada intersections. Traffic signal preemption provides the green lights at signalized intersections to emergency vehicles. To reduce delays and minimize signal disruptions, FAST submitted a competitive grant, the SMART grant, for advanced GPS signal preemption, which will provide technology to allow emergency vehicles and traffic signals to communicate when responding to an emergency. We partnered with this grant with City of Las Vegas and we are waiting to hear the outcome of that. At the Southern Nevada Traffic Management Center, FAST manages traffic incidents along with our, pro our partner agencies co-located at that facility, including Nevada Highway Patrol, Nevada Department of Transportation, and the Department of Public Safety. Using the RECORE traffic management platform, we manage crashes, police activity, stalled vehicles, roadway debris, and a variety of other incidents that occur along our local roadway network. In 2021, FAST managed more than 9,981 incidents, equaling roughly 28 per day. In 2022, this is up roughly 31%. FAST managed more than 12,477 incidents, now equaling closer to 35 incidents per day. Contributing factors to this may be FAST's recent adoption of an application called Pulse Point, where we're getting more information directly from the local police departments and fire stations as they're getting in emergency calls. We're gonna continue to track this information and we'll be sharing it with you next year for updates. Using the RECOR platform and ITS device data, we can track historical crash information and now provide data-driven decisions to show trending for high crash locations, days of the week, and times of the day. Sharing this information with law enforcement and emergency responders allows for proactive enforcement and staging of resources. As you can see, the highlighted portion of this is along I-15 with the darker red closer to the resort corridor. That is where we see the majority of our highway crashes. We have many traffic management projects going on currently at the FAST department. We have the infrastructure master plan. The RTC's infrastructure master plan will bring Southern Nevada's, Southern Nevada's dated communication network up to speed with advanced transportation technologies, including state-of-the-art traffic management systems, connected and autonomous vehicle applications, and emergency services. Benefits of this project include additional security capacity and reliability, as well as the way to identify our current gaps in our network so that we can actually start filling them in and have redundancy in case of outages. We also have ramp metering operations, which we work with closely with Nevada Department of Transportation. FAST performed the annual review of the ramp metering operations at all 74 locations in the Southern Nevada network, and we proposed the, uh, the following recommendations, which we are underway with implementing. 
We are implementing um, a pilot corridor on I-15 for 24-7 operations of ramp metering. We have also changed some of the trigger thresholds for the speeds on, um, for activation on the ramp meters from 46 miles an hour when the roadways are already starting to see congestion up to 50 miles an hour to preventively um, address, proactively address congestion, as well as changing the lanes that are being calculated. For the, uh, for the ramp meter algorithm. Advanced intersection analytics is another project that we'd like to share with you. This was brought up when we gave the presentation last year on the state of the traffic system. There was several concerns about high speed crashes as well as near misses at intersections and red light running. As part of that discussion, RTC FAST has gone ahead with putting out a um, proposal to the local industry so that we can start identifying technology solutions to start creating a um, red light running and near miss frequency database so that we can better track this information and share with our partner agencies and law enforcement better ways to address this. The last project that I'd like to address is called the Safe Tech Corridor. This was part of an ATCMTD grant from Federal Highways on US 95 between Summerlin Parkway and I-15. This project has been awarded with $6 million grant from the, DO, uh, from the United States Department of Transportation and Federal Highways with the plans to include an expansion of the arrow over lane signs along that portion of US 95, which we know is a heavy commuter route, as well as including wrong way driver um, warning systems on the off ramp. In addition, there will also be um, strategic traffic management sites for law, uh, for law enforcement to be able to position themselves proactively. And then also, um, this project is currently at 60% design and should begin construction in the middle of 2024 with an 18-month construction schedule. I love this picture. This is Allegiant Stadium on a game day, so you can see all the buses lined up. As the entertainment capital of the world has continued to expand its offerings to include major sporting events. The RTC created the Regional Event Traffic Management Committee. We meet with the venues, the agencies, and law enforcement, along with our local partners, to better understand regional impacts to a multiple events in various at various venues occurring simultaneously. We understand that that has a compounding impact and has a larger regional influence on our traffic system. Some of the events that FAST actively managed, there was 325 of them in 2022, including the NFL Draft, the Raiders games, the VGK games, EDC, the Electric Days of Carnival, um, concerts and sporting events. FAST is highly focused on public engagement from sending hashtag FAST alerts to posting on the electronic freeway signs FAST work with the local media stations on a daily basis to provide camera views to the, keep the public informed on active traffic conditions. In 2022, FAST posted almost 4,000 unique messages on DMS and ATM freeway signs to alert drivers of traffic conditions. Also in 2022, FAST worked closely with the media to proactively share closures of traffic closures and road conditions so the public can make informed decisions about their trips during planned holiday weekends such as Labor Day, Memorial Day, and Thanksgiving. Our media partners have found this content helpful as it provides the, meet the public with information about the best times to travel during the holidays. The last item I'd like to touch on is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. There are currently two different projects that the FAST Department has submitted on in November of 2022. The first one I had just mentioned uh, briefly, that is the Strengthening Mobility and Revolutionizing Transportation Grant, the SMART Grant. That is a GPS-based vehicle preemption system along Charleston Boulevard near the University Medical Center. The second grant that we proposed on is the Advanced Transportation Technology and Innovation Grant, the ATTAIN Grant. We also submitted that in November of 2022. That is to procure and deploy a new central traffic signal system in the Southern Nevada region, including capabilities for adaptive signal control, transit signal prioritization, and automated signal performance metrics.
Thank you very much. That concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Council. Yeah. I'm curious, when you, when you get all of your data on um, accidents or incidents, do you ever look into what percentage of those happen in work zones versus just out on the street? I do know that that is one of the factors that is tracked whenever incidents do occur, and I do know that that is something that law enforcement um, notates on um, their incident reports, and then that is uh, included in the database of all incidents. Next, I think, would be interesting to see those numbers in this report. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. With the question. Yes. Uh, what, can you tell us what you're doing about uh, the wrong way drivers? Yes. So at the off ramps between on US 95 between Summerlin Parkway and I-15 as part of the Safe Tech grant, there will be wrong way driver systems installed. Right now it's agnostic. We don't have a specific vendor that, uh, that we're looking at. But the intention of these is that there's three different zones on those off ramps that are um, signaled by camera and um, detection of vehicles entering the wrong way. The first area allows the it gives the vehicle notification that they've entered the wrong way within a range where they can um, clearly turn around safely. The next one is the advanced one that tells you that you are about to enter the main line of the freeway and that has a second level of warning system. And at that point, that then triggers a camera that t uh, under most of the systems that triggers a camera to take an image of the vehicle so that that could be shared back to the traffic management center. Upon receiving information like that, the traffic management center now has an image of what that vehicle potentially looks like, that it's crossed the barrier on the on-ramp where it's going to be about to enter the main line. And then what it also does is it also shows us exactly which ramp was activated. So with that information, we can start proactively messaging on the freeway for wrong-way drivers and also alert um, law enforcement. But just to follow up, I mean, it sounds like this is an increasing problem, and could we add more money? I mean, they said nothing's on the 215. Um, so to it just that seems like we need to get, get moving on it. To that point, um, I do know that we do have Tracy Larkin Thomason mm -hmm. from the Nevada Department of Transportation. I do know that the Department of Transportation is working on a statewide wrong way driver plan, and that that expands more regionally than what I can address specifically on this particular project. So we do know that this is something that we're looking at on a statewide and regional level to address and actually have this technology more widespread. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Why don't you go, yeah. Actually, I did want to say we have four scheduled to go in the Las Vegas region, and we have been very particularly uh, targeting um, down here. We are having some issues with procurement. They're literally like eight months out, so it's taking a little bit longer to get them in. But we are targeting, if we had more wrong way detection systems up in northern Nevada, there were pilot systems, and so now we are now concentrating on spreading it down here in southern Nevada and expanding the system. And obviously working with fast our partner in there to get as many out there as possible because you are absolutely correct it is a rising problem and it's growing each time or each year thank you mr chair i'm not going to confess to anything right now <laughs> um <laughs> so have you seen a correlation between those of us that depend on um, direction, things on our phone or on our car as to turn in 90 feet and we think 90 feet is actually 90 feet and not 60 feet and it's 60 feet and not 90 feet and therefore some of us may be tempted to turn on an on off ramp instead of an on ramp and is there a correlation with that issue and is there a way to rectify that so we don't we don't get uh, confused purely hypothetical right mayor totally <laughs> for that specific question what i would say is that we are um, always working with the local agencies and especially the dot at um at on and off ramps to make sure that it is the latest standard for enhanced signage 
especially when there could be potential ramps side by side, but there may be an issue with confusion of um, when you're following navigation apps. We are also working um, uh, consistently with navigation apps to make sure that there is current information on uh, roadway conditions in there. That was very gentle, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Vice Chair. Oh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm very happy to hear um, the, the FAST team obviously is, is out there and of course uh, we're getting more and more data dependent, more digital dependent. Uh, how are we doing, uh, how, how are we doing on the infrastructure necessary to make sure that we carry out FAST uh, missions? Uh, what, what I mean, not just, you know, the, the physical one, how are we doing with personnel? Um, do we have, the, with, with personnel hiring and all that being at a premium, are we keeping up with, uh, with the personnel necessary to be able to make, make sure that FAST goes interrupted? Obviously, it's, we're, we're talking about public safety here. Thank you very much. I appreciate that question. Yes, that is definitely in the forefront of our minds is that we want to make sure that we are making um, the correct decisions when it comes to personnel. So over the last several years, we have had many folks retire from FAST and we are very fortunate in the fact that we have been able to refill all of those positions as well as add an additional five positions as needed over the last five years to the department. But it is, I think it's <coughs> worth mentioning, uh, Vice Chair, that when it comes to uh, monitoring and enforcing traffic safety on the freeway system, uh, the Nevada State Police are, are woefully understaffed. And so that makes it very difficult. And I also know that both the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department and some of the other jurisdictions are also having staffing issues, which uh, makes it very difficult for enforcement on our arterials. I will say, though, that the city of Nova Vegas did introduce AB 30 that might help, that might help us in recruiting peace officers throughout the state. Just thought, I thought I'd throw that out there. Very good. Councilman Knudsen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a quick question. I thought it was a great presentation. It's some of this information is relatively new for me. Uh, if I look at this board, I believe I'm the least experienced up here, so I'm happy to say that. Uh, my question is about the, the relationship between this data and the law enforcement. I, I think that's important for me because that's a lot of the constituent requests I get is for greater enforcement related to traffic. So how is the information shared with Metro? Just to kind of dive into those details because I think that's useful for me to be able to share with constituents as well. Absolutely, thank you for that question. I appreciate it. We do have a very um, uh, well-founded uh, re um, relationship with law enforcement here in Southern Nevada. We are fortunate that we have Nevada Department of Trans, um, sorry, um, Nevada Highway Patrol within our actual Southern Nevada Traffic Management Center. But just because Metro is not co-located with us at that facility does not mean that we don't share information equally with them. We have regular meetings with them. We do do our regional coordination with them. And then many of the large scale efforts such as Dropicana or uh, concerts or major events that are happening, we actually do work those events side by side with them um, either at their fusion center or at other locations. I believe what you're also asking is about just day to day what is going on on our local roadways and that is information that we are sharing. So for example, as we get better information out of the advanced intersection analytics project and we can better understand the, um, the um, uh, conditions that create or may influence the red light running or near misses, we will be sharing that directly with uh, the Las Vegas Metro Police Department. In addition to that, we worked with them side by side as we were looking at intersections to apply that technology to. So they gave us a list as well as every local jurisdiction. We asked for high crash locations. We were then able to compile all those together and those were the intersections that were selected to be teamed up with these pilot projects. Councilman Shaw. Um, very briefly, does our system interface with, for example, Google Maps to alert drivers of congestion and if they're going the wrong way? So what we do is that we do have a direct partnership with the Waze Navigation app. Um, Waze is a um, subsidiary within the Google organization. We have been working more closely to try to make sure that that data is then being shared up um, to the Google platform. 
but as it comes to wrong way drivers, that would not be something that you would see on your navigation app. Hmm. Um, should Director Larkin toss some comments in? Oh, did you have more, Councilman? No. Okay. I just wanted to put a plug in actually for RTC was one of the things, not with that the challenge is regarding, but the last two years I've been working in DC with a national organization with technology and transportation and RTC is listed as like the number one model across the nation because of the collaboration between the different entities and that it actually covers all regionals and it's not independent. And you don't know how many times I called MJ and Therese and said, can you come talk? Can you come here? I just want to put that out there because it is truly unique and even though there are challenges as we need to update different factions of it, different parts, it is truly remarkable that it is as well known across the nation as it is. Yeah, and I would just say for, for new board members, if you haven't already been out to the uh, FAST uh, Center, um, it's amazing. You have, you have NDOT employees and RTC employees uh, co-located and I think it's the largest uh, TV uh, bay outside of a casino sports book, right? Right. That's yeah. right. Okay. Mr. Vice Chair? No, actually, I think, uh, I think she kind of ad addressed uh, a concern slash question, so great. Although I would love to watch the Super Bowl at the fast <laughs> center. <laughs> we can make that happen. <laughs> Very good. A mayor? Yes. Um, uh, welcome back um, after your many years, and, uh, and then uh, knowing you have that historical vantage point, we've been asked over the years, especially in my office, um, about why we're not using teeth in the road of wrong way drivers. They have been exemplary in stopping people from doing that, but I know there must be reasons that we're not doing it on our public roadways. It's funny, I was asked that question just the other day. I don't fully know completely why, but there are some of my first thoughts without going, getting more information on it is oftentimes we have to send law enforcement or emergency vehicles up those ramps also backwards. So it needs to be something that could go down or up or down or something like that. Well, hopefully there'll be more deeper looks into it because I know it's been extremely effective in private areas one mistake and, and notification that those teeth are there, even the one that is most imbibed, um, they do tend to stop you immediately. Very good. Um, thank you so much for your presentation and for uh, answering all of our many questions. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Chairman, Therese, before she goes, just you know, a big shout out to Therese and her team. I. Uh, you know, when, when I took over, I said we want to go after every single federal dollar that we can, every grant opportunity, and there's a lot of grant opportunity in the new inf infrastructure law, and so they are uh, busy, and the fact that they're going after, we're going after the ATTAIN grant. The ATTAIN grant is going to allow us, it's going to be a, a massive project, but it will be, be this new central system, traffic system software. That new software will allow, again, for advanced intersection analytics across the valley if necessary for adaptive traffic signal control, uh, for some of the advanced GPS detection systems. So uh, I just wanna, uh, Dave and his team, Teresa, they do such a great job. It's a 24-7 it's a kind of operation and, and I wanna thank her specifically because whenever I say, hey, we wanna go after this grant, she's like, let's go for it. Thank you so much, MJ. Okay. Can you. I just follow up, Mr. Chair? So on that, I saw yesterday that the Biden administration just gave out a ton of money on safe roads is that something that she's doing that we're reaching out? Did we get one of those grants? We're we gonna try to get those grants. You are a mind reader because I was just gonna let you know <laughs> uh, that <laughs> before Thank we you. close out the C report, I'm, I'm happy to share that the RTC was recently awarded nearly $1.7 million from the Federal Highway Administration through the Safe Streets and Roads for All grant. This funding will help us work with each of the local government entities to develop an action plan to improve safety for all roadway users. We will be looking at high crash areas and working to solve for the most significant safety issues, including speed, roadway width, and lighting. This will be a benefit to everyone in our valley, whether they walk, ride, drive, or use transit. Resident and visitor safety is our top priority, so we are truly grateful for the support from each of you and our federal delegation to make this happen. So we look forward, we're working specifically, of course, with Andrew Bennett from uh, Clark County's uh, Office of Safety and the rest of the jurisdictions. And uh, I believe this is um, a, 12 to 18 month plan, and then we'll come back with the results of that plan. All right, thank you very much. That concludes your report.
this concludes the CEO report, uh, but before we go to the next item, uh, the NDOT director's report, I'm pleased to introduce NDOT's new director, Tracy Larkin-Thomason. Tracy most recently served as a senior vice president of program development for the Intelligent Transportation Society of America in Washington, D.C. Prior to that, she spent more than 30 years working in various senior level roles at NDOT, including more than eight years as a deputy director for Southern Nevada, where she oversaw NDOT's three engineering districts in the civil rights program. And Tracy, we are so excited to have you back. You are such a great collaborator, and we look forward to working very close with you well into the future. Welcome back. Thank you. I am very pleased to be back. And I did want to say, particularly after spending two years in Washington, D.C., Nevada is very refreshing. So I'm truly looking forward to reconnecting with those here in Southern Nevada. Um, I have finished up, uh, since I'm only three weeks in the position and catching up, it's going to be a very short report today. I didn't think you'd mind too much. Um, so basically, let's see. Um, normally, we would start this presentation with some safety facts. They are not prepared at this point. But in the future, since I still do believe, still, I do believe that um, safety is really important, I plan to just show some statistics to, mind, to remind us of where we are and what we're working for. So I'm going to go right into some project updates. So everybody is familiar with the Tropicana interchange. So basically, the we completed Tropicana, which included an eight-day closure of Tropicana Avenue and a three-day closure of I-15. We really want to thank everyone in the area for their patience. Um, we also thank the press for helping, helping spread the word about the closures. The crews demolished the north half of the Tropicana Bridge over I-15, as well as a portion of the flyover from southbound I-15 to eastbound Tropicana. The Tropicana Bridge over I-15 is going to be rebuilt taller, wider, and longer so that we can increase capacity, safety, and mobility, working in concert with those three, um, those three targets that Teresa just mentioned. The diverging diamond interchange is necessary during construction while bit lanes are reduced. It is designed to increase the efficiency and safety during construction. Uh, this does mean a bit of a learning curve for drivers, and I will say the first thing I did this morning was drive through it so I could actually experience it myself. And I agree, there's a learning experience for drivers. Um, our crews continue to evaluate the driver behavior and make changes to the DDI when uh, the diverging diamond interchange when necessary. The Tropicana Avenue is rebuilt and reopens in mid-2024. It'll be four lanes in each direction with increased capacity and will be in, in a more traditional traffic alignments. And you can get more of this at our website, i15trop.com. Next, a major one down here, is the I-15 Charleston interchange. We have some important closures to note for this interchange project. Work here started in August of 2022, and we are approximately 25% done. As a reminder, this project adds an additional lane on I-15 around the Charleston curve. It also creates a new configuration at Charleston with additional capacity and turning movements. There are a number of lighting upgrades and aesthetic enhancements to fit in with the East Las Vegas neighborhood. And as part of the project, crews need to close Stewart Street under I-15 next week from Monday night at 8 p.m. until Friday morning at 5 a.m. That closure is necessary to install the girders on the I-15 bridge to allow for the widening. There are additional one-week closures at Mojave and Pagos. And next month, we will close the northbound ramp to I-15 from Charleston, and that ramp will be closed for approximately 30 days. And as always, we'll put out plenty of advance notice to the drivers to warn them of staying uh, where they need to work around. So that actually ends my report today, but I want the board to know that along with relevant ENDA and USDOT updates, I will be reaching out over the next few months. I do have to do some work at the legislature. They kind of insist on it. Um, but I want to reach out to each of you to talk to you and understand what your goals are for your respective jurisdictions and then to shape my future reports to actually be most meaningful to Southern Nevada and to each of you. So I look forward to working with you. I truly do. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Any questions? I'm just going to say, I'll put it in the bug in your ear. We need an interchange at Sahara in 95. Noted. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Thanks. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, the next item is to uh, approve the consent agenda, which consists of items 6 through 30 and can be taken in one motion. Very good. On the chair motion. All right. There's a motion to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 
Thanks, Chairman. Uh, the next item is agenda item 31 is to receive a recommendation from the request for proposals evaluation committee to enter into negotiations for transit service operations and maintenance with the highest, highest scored proposer, First Transit, and authorize RTC staff to enter into negotiations with First Transit and to prepare a contract for future, future approval uh, that we bring this back to the March board meeting. So I'm gonna ask Mallory Sears, she is RTC's purchasing manager, she has a presentation for you. Can you hear me? There we go, okay, sorry. Good morning, Mallory Sear representing RTC purchasing and contracts this morning. I am here to present to you about the RFP process for transit service operations and maintenance and seek your approval of the agency's recommendation for negotiation purposes. At the May 22 RTC board meeting, a two-step RFP process that will be summarized today was approved. The public solicitation began in June 2022. Please note this was a request for proposals, not a low bid solicitation. An evaluation team was selected to review the proposals throughout the entire process. That included six internal staff members who are subject matter experts and one external subject matter expert. Step one was open for all potential proponents and included six key areas to be considered in their submitted response. The six areas of focus were one, management and key personnel, two, transition and startup plan, three, staffing and personnel, field supervision, dispatch and operations management plan, four, employee training, five, vehicle and equipment maintenance, and six, safety, security, and emergency management program. Six proposals were received. Three proponents did not score high enough to move on to the next step, and they were Coach, National Express, and TransDev. A score of acceptable was the requirement in the instructions to move to step two. The point total required to move on was 66.67 or higher. Three proponents did score high enough to move to the second step, and they were First Transit, EOLIS, and MV Transportation. All three of these proponents are nationally recognized transit agencies that have a history working as great partners of the RTC. Please note that step one scores did not roll over to impact step two. Step two was opened to the three proponents who passed step one. The price portion of this step was evaluated by RTC finance staff and an external auditing team. The technical proposal included a written response focused on one, innovation solutions and community partner, ships, two, workforce recruitment and retention, and three, service delivery plan. In addition, they came to, an to carry out an interview in person at the RTC offices. The results of step two are presented here. As noted on the slide, First Transit was the highest ranked proponent at a score of 93.1. Keola scored 85 and MV Transportation scored 81.6. The technical capacity of each firm was reviewed and assessed along with their financial pros proposal and the fiscal health of their respective companies. The staffing plans were reviewed during step one and then evaluated against their detailed price forms submitted in step two. As part of the RFP procedure, a best and final offer process was used to ensure each proponent had an opportunity to refine and address any discrepancies that they deemed appropriate. As part of the FTA's procurement guidelines, an independent cost estimate was completed by RTC finance staff prior to the public solicitation's commencement in June 22. The ICE was revised in January 2023 by RTC finance staff to ensure alignment with the CBAs held by Keolis and MV Transportation with the Amalgamated Transit Union. Both Keolis and MV Transportation opened a portion of their union contracts early to increase employee wages due to the ongoing labor shortage. Keolis revised their CBA with the ATU on October 11th, 2022 and MV Transportation revised their CBA with the ATU on October 28, 2022. Two proponents, First Transit and MV Transportation, were within 1% of the revised ICE. Based upon the objective weighting for each proponent submission, First Transit is the prevailing party. First Transit scored the highest of any proponent in all technical categories of step two. RTC staff is recommending approval by the board to enter into negotiations with First Transit. 
all staff impacted by this RFP, extend sincere thanks to all of those who participated in the solicitation process. Thank you very much, appreciate uh, the tremendous amount of time that went into um, all those participated in the process, the interviews, the data collection, and uh, to all those who submitted their bids and, and revised their bids, um, thank you. I know it was a, a tremendous amount of work. Um, MJ, do you wanna comment on the, the, the winning bid versus uh, the other two bidders with regards to um, the scoring on the, uh, the, the price proposal versus the other evaluation criteria? Yes, <coughs> thanks Chairman. So I, it's important to note as Mallory uh, noted in her presentation, uh, we're required by the, f the federal government, it's, uh, it's Federal Transit Administration, to ensure that we do a test of reasonableness uh, to ensure that the price proposals that come in, in, in fact, are reasonable. It's also just a best practice, a procurement best practice standard. And so we wanted to make sure that the bids that we received uh, were reasonable in relation to the scope of work submitted. In this case, uh, the number of service hours that were uh, in the RFP that the respondents uh, responded to. And uh, in this case, um, both First Transit and MV were within less than 1% of our independent cost estimate. Uh, once again, deemed very reasonable. And then you compound that with the fact that First Transit scored the highest in every single technical category, uh, with, which placed them again as the as the first uh, proposal, the one that we were recommending to begin contract negotiations with. Very good. Any other questions uh, from the board? Dick? Are we allowed to make comments given the, the law? Comments in general or questions are appropriate to ask the, the staff okay. if you deem appropriate. I, I, I'm just concerned. I know that the winning bidder, which seems like a good company, has just been bought by one of the companies that didn't even make the final three. So I want to make sure going forward that we make sure that that new company is not re re respects what this company that, that first transit won, uh, whatever their bid was, that they don't get involved mm -hmm. in that. Okay. Come in. Appreciate that, Commissioner. I think that will be teased out during the contract negotiations and duly noted. Any, any other questions, Councilman? Yeah, just for the uh, for the public's um, for the public's um, how should I say benefit. Um, that's one thing that that I've learned in the city uh, of North Las Vegas that sometimes um, value and um, bids uh, are two different things. Um, uh, I, in my experience uh, in the city of North Vegas, we've seen uh, people who uh, were the uh, low bidder on a certain project, and uh, later on, you know, uh, the value of that bid didn't seem to match. In this case, uh, although um, the public will see that this was uh, one of the more expensive ones, although I will point out it's only uh, it's only one percent more than uh, the, the the one who came in third place. Um, we uh, very much will, uh, uh, I know that the team looked at different deliverables, uh, things that are a lot more important, I, I think, to the public. And for uh, a person who represents uh, a portion of our city that relies very heavily on public transportation, um, I am very happy that, uh, well, I, I, should, I should say it like this. Um, I have every, uh, I have every uh, bit of uh, trust and faith that the team that was evaluating uh, all the bidders uh, did their due diligence, and uh, I uh, have a lot of faith that, uh, that uh, their due diligence will uh, actually come out uh, in favor of our public, especially my residents in North Vegas. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and uh, once again, we appreciate all that uh, Keolis and, um, and MV of Transportation have done over the last several, several years. Mr. Shaw. MJ. In my merger and acquisition experience, when we're talking about these kinds of major contracts, uh, it's not unusual to have a transition audit so that the new party knows exactly what their assets are when they take over these contracts. Are we anticipating that? You know, that's a great question because we have some hard lessons learned uh, from pre previous transitions, particularly when we went from one contractor to two ba uh, about 10 years ago. So uh, we've taken extra steps to ensure that RTC's assets uh, are, are, we know what they are versus what the, the contractor is either gonna leave or stay. So uh, again, we, I don't think we did a great job years ago. 
uh, we put some systems in place to ensure that it's, a, it's seamless. Thank you. And I would just note that the greatest asset that we have uh, are the people who have been working, the, the drivers, the mechanics, et cetera. And I understand from First Transit that's definitely something that they're considering and will be part of uh, discussions. So with that, I'll entertain a motion to uh, authorize RTC staff. Oh, what was that? Oh, sure, Councilman. I'd like to thank the gentleman from MV that showed up earlier for the comments he made. And this could have been ugly, but the fact you want to make a seamless transition, that means a lot to me. So thank you very much. Yep. All right, with that, I'll entertain a motion to authorize RTC staff to enter into negotiations with First Transit and prepare a contract for future approval. Second. All right, so there's a motion on the floor. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Congratulations. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, next item is uh, agenda item number 32, and that's going to be presented by Mark Trostall, our Chief Financial Officer. Thank you, MJ. Item 32 is to have the board appoint three members and an alternate to the RTC Finance Committee. The RTC Finance Committee meets as needed to review the RTC's budget for the following fiscal year and direct staff as to what items should be considered for inclusion in the budget. The committee is comprised of three members and one alternate from the RTC Board of Commissioners. Staff recommends the board appoint the members and the three members and an alternate to the committee. The tentative and final budgets will be, will be presented to the board for its approval. Thank you very much. Um, I will volunteer uh, for that. Anyone else? Okay, Councilman, um, Councilman, Councilman. All right, um, then uh, let's see. Uh, Either of you would like to be the alternate. <laughs> Councilman Shaw, are you okay with being alternate? Okay. All right, very good. Then the uh, committee will be, uh, I'll make a motion to appoint myself, Councilman Barone, Councilman Knudsen uh, as the members of the finance committee and Councilman Shaw as the alternate. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the next item is uh, item number 33, and that will be presented by Francis Julian, uh, Deputy CEO. Good morning, members of the, the board. Francis uh, Julian, uh, RTC Deputy CEO, for the record. Uh, item number three, 33 is to appoint the evaluation committee members to assess the performance of the RTC CEO, MJ Maynard, uh, for the calendar year 2022. The board will need to appoint three members and one alternate. So at this time, I'll turn, I'll turn it over to uh, Chairman Justin Jones. Uh, for discussion. Thank you very much. I understand that it's generally done where the flood control and RTC evaluation uh, committees are the same. So if that is agreeable, um, then uh, Mayor Goodman, Councilman Barone, and myself as the as the committee members and, and Councilman Knudsen as the alternate. Does that work? All right, with that, I'll, I'll make that motion uh, for, for appointment. Thank you. Oh, uh, hold on, we have to vote. Sorry. All those in favor? Aye. <laughs> Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, the next item is to receive information from our legal counsel. There are none to discuss, so we can move on to your last agenda item, which is to conduct your final citizens participation period. Thank you very much. This is the second time set aside for public comment. Anyone wishing to provide public comment with regards to matters before the RTC, please step forward to the microphone, state your name, and spell your last name for the record, and please limit your comments to three minutes. I did receive a card for uh, Shelly Jones. Good morning, my name is Shelly Jones, and I have several comments to make. The first is I want to congratulate the person who gave the idea for Serve drivers. That's a great program. I love it. I also ride the buses, and there's a lot of really cool drivers you guys have. The one thing I do want to mention is my girlfriend who is over 70 
and she is losing her sight, unfortunately. She was attacked by a DNLU on January 13th. She had called to tell me this, and I told her the things that she needed to do. I don't know, because I've been very ill lately. And um, she had suffered, this person had bit her in the arm, hit her in the head several times. She's got lumps in her head, kicked her knee, and she's got a big, huge goose egg on her knee. Fortunately, this person is not riding the bus anymore. However, RTC needs to compensate her for all the medical costs and to give her some type of um, punitive damage payment for all the trouble they've caused her. And I don't know, I haven't been in touch with her because I've been ill. I did talk to her the other day, but it was for very brief. Anyways, other than that, I do like the drivers. I do like all the drivers. They're very professional. And you need to know that they're very professional. Unfortunately, the driver that sh on the bus that she was on did not do anything, did not correct the person. And I know for a fact that the drivers are not allowed to touch the clients. However, the driver should have handled it a lot better. And I don't feel that this driver should be working. I feel that he should be unemployed and looking for work elsewhere because of what it he didn't do. Other than that, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. And we'll follow up with you with regards to get the information for your girlfriend. Anyone else wishing to provide public comment? Nope. Sure, coming forward. Hi, um, I'm Brad Thomas. I'm the uh, CEO of First Transit. Um, just wanted to say uh, uh, thank you uh, on behalf of First Transit uh, to um, the board, um, to the RTC leadership and MJ, RTC staff, all the folks that worked on the evaluation committee for recognizing the value in our proposal um, to operate the fixed draft system. I'd also like to say that I would, uh, to th I'd also like to thank uh, both MD and Keolis for their commitment to working together for a seamless uh, transition, which we can uh, assure you that we will make sure that that happens. And uh, we look forward to the next steps and a successful negotiation of the contract. So thank you for having faith in us. Thank you very much. Anyone else wishing to provide public comment? Mr. Marion. Good morning, <coughs> uh, Bill Marion, Purdue Marion Associates for the record. Uh, you may be aware, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention, particularly because of the conversation regarding people going the wrong way. A uh, dear friend of mine, Jose Tavares, was killed in an accident this weekend, uh, and Jessica Tavares, his wife, uh, is out of e ICU and hopefully will recover. But this they own a company, Southwest or SW Marketing, that we have actually partnered with on many occasions, uh, particularly with a couple of RTC public outreach projects. So I'd just like to, you know, maybe just say to remember them today, particularly because of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for letting us know. Sir? Good morning. Uh, my name is Francisco. Gamboa, G-A-M-B-O-A. I am a transit operator currently out of uh, the AMV yard, Division 222. Uh, and I just wanted to wish the council and the board the best of luck with this transition. And I know that as an operator, I'm here to uh, do the work that needs to be done to make this as seamless as possible and to be able to also uh, make it as seamless as possible for our customers. And so just best of luck and congratulations. We really appreciate that. We, like I said, you're you're our greatest asset, and we want to work with you to make sure that is painless and uh, and and wonderful. Anyone else wishing to provide public comment? Commissioners, staff, 
I'm Sandy Hill, Vice President of Business Development for Keolis. And um, to say I'm disappointed is a massive understatement. We've built such a beautiful partnership over the past 10 years and done a lot of good together. Um, but on behalf of Keolis, I share the sentiments of Terry and of course Brad. Um, we of course want to make the smoothest transition and we have a local team committed. So moving forward, although I stand here uh, genuinely sad to be in this position, um, we wish you the best, the commission and its new members, the staff and those of you I haven't been able to talk to you for so long, the community that we're so proud to be a, a part of, and of course the local team who is completely invested. So as I stand here, um, I hope this isn't goodbye. I hope it's, we'll see you again soon. Thank you, we appreciate that. Anyone else wishing to provide public comment? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and uh, close uh, public comment. And uh, Mr. Chairman, just, could you just, for everybody's sake, just give again the date when we're allowed to talk to somebody? That would be, we'll post the agenda March 2nd. So after the agenda's posted on March 2nd, please, let me talk to everybody. Thanks, Commissioner. <laughs> All right, with that, we are adjourned. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>